Since the advent of digital sequencing technology, the user interface has been a barrier for some people. With previous music technology, analog sequencers, analog synthesizers, etc., each control had its own dedicated function. And if you moved that, you knew exactly what you were going to get. But the complexity of software in particular means that just isn't the case anymore. Many users transitioning from analog workflows with large mixing desks, etc., felt that mixing with a mouse was something that they didn't want to do. And there's been all sorts of attempts to bridge this gap over the years. Some successful, some not successful. But what's definitely the case now is that cheap USB-based MIDI controllers are fairly widely available. I'm, I'm surrounded by things that I've uh, collected over the years. So whether it's this kind of controller where you've got a few buttons and a few encoders, or one which is sort of like a, a mixer. Uh, I'm not sponsored by Akai or Behringer. They're just cheap on Gumtree, that's all it is. Uh, or it's one with a load of buttons and more sliders, etc. Or it's something which is maybe replicating part of another controller, strangely. So this is like a cut down copy of part of a Mackie control. Uh, they're fairly ubiquitous, but often you've had two routes. Either you use the manufacturer's setup, which in many cases, such as this, means that you have to emulate a Mackie control, or you have a long and torturous, painful route of setting up the MIDI control yourself. This has never been that friendly or satisfactory in Cubase, but in Cubase 12, there's a completely new MIDI remote control architecture, which promises the user to be able to just set one up themselves. It's designed to be usable by even the most casual user, but also it has two faces. So manufacturers can create their own using one system, or you can create your, your own custom version of it with less control than a manufacturer would get, but certainly much more ease because it's literally a case of plug in your controller, run through a fairly simple process, and then assign these controls that you've created to whatever function you want in Cubase. But will this simplification of a complex topic allow it to do everything that you might need it to do? And is this going to cover all the bases from just you know Joe Blow who just wants to have a couple of faders on his synth all the way up to somebody who wants total control of every function and lots of information coming out. Well, hopefully this video will answer that question. So here we are in Cubase and as you can see, the bottom zone now has a new tab in, which is MIDI remote. And at the moment, nothing is connected. So we either have the option to add a MIDI controller surface or if we plug one in that it already knows about, it will appear. So the MPK Mini Mark III is one of the factory pre-installed devices which uses the system for manufacturers to use so they can create custom looking layouts, such as the one you can see on screen where we've got a representation of how the MPK Mini Mark III works. It's got some of these pre-configured controls. So for instance, if I press this tab, we play, I can open up the edit for the channel and close it, etc. So we've got some remotes with these pads which are on the MPK. And we've also got these controls which are pre-allocated to quick controls. So we're going to take a look at those in a second. In addition, there's also the pitch bend control which moves at the top left. So let's take a look at the quick controls and how they work because that's actually changed slightly. So if I open up uh, an instrument, we can see that this is the current focus of quick controls and the quick controls of the remote will, will be allocated to this. So if I move number one knob on my MPK, you can see filter cutoff in this case is being activated. And we can have resonance for number two. And filter distortion. 
etc. That kind of thing. So it's it's reasonably straightforward. It just means that you're already quick controlling these which have been allocated. So with the Steinberg sense, you tend to find that quick controls generally will map to something fairly sensible, but you can always reallocate them depending on your needs. Now, if we then open up a different synth, so you can see I've changed track, and what you notice is that the quick control indicator here is now no longer lit up. And if I open up the other synth which I've got here, which is Surge, we can see that the quick controls are not, in this case, doing anything because they're not allocated to anything. So in fact, if we go down to quick controls on this particular channel, we can see it's set to the macro controls, but they're not actually allocated to anything on this patch, but at least it's set to something reasonably sensible. So let's say we wanted those to stay on the Halion Sonic, even if we change focus to a different synth. We can do that really easily. So let's do that here. So now we're back on Halion Sonic. We can click that there. And if I want to lock it, I just need to lock it there. And now, even if I change to Surge, I'm moving knob number one. But you can see it's working for Filter Cutoff on Halion Sonic as Quick Control 1, even though I've actually got Surge open and I might even have Surge being edited, etc. So that works really nicely. It's also possible to do that locking here. So now it's gone back to the track, which I've got focused and then I can just lock it there like that if I want to. You can also choose the way that this follows track and plugin focus, track focus or plugin focus etc. So it, it can make some sense. So for instance if we have a just plugin window focus only then that would kind of follow what was happening before anyway. So even though this isn't locked if I change to surge here but then have my focus on the Halion Sonic, it comes back to there. So it's up to you how you want to do it. To be honest, I've found it's just been useful just to lock it to whichever I want because that's that's been the most immediate thing. But you may find by changing the settings here that you'll get the kind of mode you want. This is probably the, the sensible thing to start off with, but it's nice to be able to do that all over the place and particularly nice just be able to quickly lock it and then keep the controls staying with what you want, even though the other controls which are set up won't do. Now, even though this is a factory mapping, uh, it is possible to add to these and add a new mapping page, which means that you can control this in exactly the same way. Now, this will be covered in more detail later on in the video when we'll look at creating one for a controller, which doesn't have a factory script. But I'm just going to run you through it now very briefly. So we can open up the mapping assistant here. And then the key here is to create a new mapping page because by default, it's just got this selected track one in the case of this one. Now I can add a new mapping page here. I'm just going to call it DJ1 because I'm a massive egotist. And now we've got that in here. The mapping works exactly the same, which I'm going to show in more detail later on in the video where we look at mapping from scratch. But effectively, it's a case of grabbing a control here. So I've just turned this control here, num number one. And now we're going to look at Cubase functions. So you can click on it, etc. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick it from the menu because the functions browser seems to work much better. So let's say I did want co focus quick controls uh, one to four. So there we go. I've set number one. And now I'm going to do number two. So again, now I'm controlling number two there. And I'm going to double click QC2. Set that to QC2. And now we're going to do number three. So we can see number three is now lit and QC3. And finally, move number four and QC4. So we can see that these have been set appropriately. Now, these next ones, we're not going to do to that. So let's set these to something different. So I'm going to move number five. So this is uh, knob number five on here, but I'm not going to set it to that. Let's look at what we've got in mix zone, mix console here, and let's just set this as pan left right for our master mix output. So, so that's pan left right for output. Number six here, we're going to set for volume. Okay, so now we've got a master 
pan control and a master volume control on knobs number five and six. Not going to map any others. You can obviously go through the section later on in the video. But now we will see if we go to the mix console here, my knob number six now is always giving me master output volume and knob number five is moving this pan control. And that will be the case regardless of what page I'm on, what channel I'm on, etc. So there's, there's quite a bit of flexibility here and it allows you to configure it the way that you want. So here you can see we've got some symbolism there. So let's just zoom in. So make that a little bit bigger. And you can see we've got an icon for pan and an icon for volume. And we can configure it to our heart's desire. So we could add extra page. But if we go back to selected track, you can see we go back to this quick control allocation and you'll see we're back to moving, in this case, the surge macro controls, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. So this is quite nice. It works quite flexibly and it's proven to be pretty useful so far. But next, let's have a look at mapping a controller from scratch. So fortunately, if you haven't got a script already created, you can create one for your controller. So here I've got an MPK Mini Mark II, which doesn't have a factory script. So if I plug it in, we see that at the moment nothing has happened. So it hasn't recognized it. It doesn't know anything about it. But fortunately, we can add a new controller. So I'm going to add a MIDI controller surface and we can pick the inputs, which in this case, input and output is MPK Mini Mark II, which is fine. Akai, it's at least selected that model. I'm going to call it MPK Mini Mark II. And script creator is going to be me. On the next page, we can now decide what kind of control. So we've got knobs, faders, and buttons, which obviously you would allocate depending on what you need. So I'm going to put in the eight pads. So firstly, I'm going to tap button here and then just press a button on the controller. And then because it's moved across, I'm going to press the next one. So I've got four, a row of four. And then the next one, I'm going to move this to where I want that to be. So I'm going to click there and then I'm going to hit the first of the next row of four, two, three, and four. I'm also going to set up the eight knobs, which are already set up and are sending out MIDI controller data. So I'm going to press the knob there and then I'm going to move that up to here by clicking and then move this first one, then the second one, third one, and fourth one. And then down here, five, six, seven, and eight. So those are all the controls which are on my controller that I want to use. So I'm going to leave the two directional joystick for the time being. So now we need to move on to mapping. So I'm going to move to the right to the mapping assistant. So you can see the eight pads and the eight knobs. And now it's exactly the same as you may have seen earlier on in the video. So it's effectively move a control and then pick something here. So at the moment, I'm just gonna set this to the quick controls, which we saw earlier on with the factory script. So I'm gonna move my first knob here and pick quick control one, double click that, and then two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So straightforward. So there, I've got that ready to go with those. Now we can also add the transport controls that we saw earlier on. So let's just take a look at one of them. So if I just tap the button here and then I can look at transport controls. So in this case, I'm going to do start, double click that. And now we have a play control set up and on the one above, I'm going to have record set up. Now, as far as navigation is concerned, these on the factory script for the Mark III were up and down. So let's just duplicate that. So again, just going to have that control there. And then it's under selected track actions, select next track and select previous track. So this is previous track. And then 
that button there, I'm going to have as next track. Now, once you've done that, you can, if you want, close this, and then you can look at any other changes that you want to make. So now we have our play control, which works here, and we can tap it again to stop. We can go into record if we want to. And we can select tracks as you can see on screen. So this is mimicking the action of the previous script we saw for the Mark III. And as we saw with the Mark III as well, we don't have to stick with just a single page. So we can go back to here. We can add a new page. So I'm going to call that channel settings for reason that will hopefully become clear in a second. And then on this, I'm now going to reallocate these knobs to something different. So again, let's look at that. We look at the selected track, EQ, and then we're going to set these to be the frequencies and these to be the gain controls. So this is going to be band one frequency. This one will be band two frequency. This one will be band three frequency. And guess what? Yep, band four frequency. And then these top ones here are going to be the gain. One, two, three, and four. And then I'm going to set these four buttons here to be the on off for each one. So now I have dedicated EQ controls for whichever channel that I'm on. So if we open up the channel settings, we can see, can turn on band one, two, three, and four, and control the frequencies, and control the gains with those two knobs. So there, that knob controls gain that's controlling the frequency now obviously because of the resolution of these controls we've only got 128 steps across this whole frequency range so this would be a bit steppy if you were using this for anything automation wise and it's not going to be precise enough for us to do detailed record you can see that's a visible difference whereas if i grab it on screen i can be much more precise if i'm actually grabbing it in there but you may well find it's reasonably useful and it's quite nice just to have some dedicated controls which you can use like that and just being able to turn them on and off quite nicely. But the flexibility of this system is huge because you've got access to so many Cubase controls. So this really is allowing you to do things which previously you had to do via emulating a Mackie control, etc. all of that kind of thing. Another thing which is really nice is you can have multiple controllers set up and active at the same time, and they generally get remembered. So when I've been playing around with this previously, when I've plugged my MPK Mini Mark II back in, it's remembered it, it's set up the script, and it's just worked, which has worked really nicely. So let's set up another controller. So now let's add the Behringer X Touch Mini, which I've just plugged in. So we can just scroll over to the right, click plus. We can see that the X Touch Mini MIDIs are already selected because they're the only ones that aren't currently in use. Let's add Behringer as the manufacturer and then X Touch Mini as the model. And then on the next one. So here we have uh, buttons knobs and faders so let's just go through these knobs so firstly we've got eight knobs across the top which are easily set in this particular mode and then we've got 16 buttons so let's just click here with a button and then press them so it often makes sense to follow the way that this auto creates these new buttons, although you can, of course, drag them around and move them. 
And the last thing we've got is a fader, which I'm going to move. And I'm just going to drag that, make it bigger and move it up. And then that will be much more like what we've got for the real thing. So you can resize them. You can resize them side to side as well if you wanted a big fat fader. Let's just move that across by one block. And there we go. You can resize the controller area should you want to. But once you've created all your controls, effectively uh, changes those. Now, when these come up, you can see which controllers have been picked. So we can see it's controller three, controller four, etc. And then we've got these notes in this case for this particular mode. So the X-Touch has two modes and this is in the standard mode rather than Mackie control mode. Once we've done that, we can obviously allocate whatever, which we've already covered previously. So I'm just going to set those up and then come back. So there once more, fairly easily, the X-Touch Mini has been set up and I have both of them running at the same time and they will both work at the same time, which is pretty useful. So back home, we can see we've got the MPK Mini Mark II set up and we've also got the X-Touch Mini set up. And the X-Touch Mini's buttons light up when the appropriate function is active. So at the moment, the button which I've got set up for stop is lit. And when I press play, that button stays lit, etc. Cycle and so on. So with a bit of appropriate marking and labeling on there, you could have a fairly useful control which would work pretty well for you. You don't get the same feedback with the macro controls feeding back to the quick controls here, but that's just the nature of the beast. But you can see that if I move the quick control on the MPK, it controls the X-Touch Mini's quick control. So it feeds back at least on screen so the controls line up, even if they're not lining up in terms of the readout on the X-Touch Mini or obviously the physical knob on the MPK Mini Mark II. Now, one really nice touch here is that it's possible to change the mapping page that you're using with a control on the controller itself. So you don't have to come to the MIDI remote section to, to change it. So I'm just going to run you through that and then set something else more interesting up. So you can see I've got two settings here. I've got the default and I've got some EQ controls which I've set up. So here we are in EQ controls. So we've got frequency gain and each band on and off. And then I've got the default page here. Now, these two buttons have been set up, as we'll see in the mapping assistant here. So this one is set to previous mapping page, and this one is set to next mapping page. And now, without touching them, just by touching the buttons on here, you can see I can change the page which I'm on, which is really useful because I can go from quick controls to my EQ setup, and then I'm going to set up another page and that's really easily done because once we've got those set up and I can keep all the transport controls and the master fader volume. So I just open the mapping assistant and now I can click the cog here. I can duplicate this. So that will be EQ controls two, and then I can change this. So I'm going to change this one now to sends. So I'm going to rename it, call it sends. And then I'm going to remove these sets here. And you can shift and select multiples. So I'm going to click on this one here and then shift and click on that one and bin all of those in one go, which now this is ready to be used for those. And again, you can move the control or you can select it on here and then you can allocate it appropriately. So here I'm going to do the level each send and here is going to be enable and just go through and do the rest of those for the other slots. Now, obviously, for this last one, I can't use that button for the enable. I could move it to another one, but I'm not going to. I'm going to leave it there and just lose the ability to do that. But you get the idea. If you'd planned ahead a bit better, possibly I would have used this one. 
But there we go. And now I can just switch between these three really quickly and easily. So there I'm on sends, there I'm on EQ controls, there I'm on default. And I can just go between them and they loop around nicely as well. So it's not just like you reach the end and then it stops. You can just go around those, those three or as many as you want. Works pretty nicely. So now we come to the limitations that, that I found. So this obviously, like everything, is my opinion. This isn't written in stone. A, you may not care about the things that I care about. That's quite likely. And B, you might not agree with some of them because some of them will be opinions. But these are what I found to be limitations. And they've been particularly when I've been trying to set this up. Okay, so my problem with this particular controller, which isn't really to do with Cubase 12 as such, is that it doesn't follow the channels in the way that I would like it to. Uh, because it's based on a Mackie control, it will follow within eight channels. But as soon as you move to channel nine, you need to change banks on here, which is not a seamless workflow. In contrast, my fader port controller does do that. So here's the fader port. It's currently plugged in, so I'm not going to unplug it in case it kills Cubase. Uh, and no matter what track I'm on, it follows it and the fader represents the level of the track. And it's got to the point where I noticed that if I'm working on a laptop or in someone else's studio, I reach out for a controller that isn't there because I've got so used to changing the volume on it. It works really well for me. I never found multi-channel multi ones worked well because you never know which fade is which. Once you've got eight tracks, you're fine. But as soon as you've got more than that, you have to think, am I on the right page? So that's why I wanted to try and set this up. The problem with this is it doesn't yet give access to what I want. So while it does work in terms of this, so let's make no mistake, it does work in terms of the basic functions. The things which MIDI remote control can't do at the moment is output information. And I think that's a bit of a pity because this would have been fine if you could get all of your bars beats display on here and a readout on here, but that isn't there. I have no idea whether or not that's gonna be added, but to give life to these kind of controls via this means that's the only way that's gonna work. And it would really, really open up the flexibility of it. Editing is a bit limited because it's it's very nice the way you can just, you know, create some controls and then play around with them. But after that, you can't change the data for that. So it's, it's a little bit annoying. You can't change uh, the kind of thing which triggers that. And I found a few cases where it was easier just to start from scratch than it was to start replacing things. So, yeah, you can delete that, but it makes it more difficult and you can't say, oh, you know what, I want to change that. I realize that that's done for a reason to make it kind of uh, point and click, but I'm a bit, I want it my way. I also appreciate that I could edit the files to change that, but then we've moved away from what Cubase does and you've got into a sort of code editing nerdery. Thirdly, I found there's been some issues during testing, which hopefully will have been uh, fixed either by now or in a, in a later update to Cubase where some controllers didn't represent the state on screen perfectly when in the real world. So if you change channels, the, the lights on the channel wouldn't necessarily uh, represent what was happening. So it was maybe sending out the wrong messages or sending out a message in a format that which confused the controller, even though the controller was set up appropriately. It's also not possible to disconnect the input message from the output message. So with most controllers, if you press a button, it generates a signal, which when, if you send it to it, it will light that up and vice versa. But it would be nice to have the option to, to send something else. So if I pressed that button there, it would light up something else rather than itself. So again, that would be a much more complicated setup, but it would be nice to be able to do that because there's so much flexibility, which is just a few steps away. So those for me are the limitations that I found. Some of them potentially may be addressed by the time of Cubase's release or a couple of you know bug releases uh, later on. But I really think to reach its full potential, it needs to be able to output information such as you know bars and beats, 
signal level, that kind of thing, uh, in a series of common formats, which probably already exists somewhere, because after all, so many things speak Mackie control, and being able to effectively take a Mackie control preset and then tweak it to make it Cubase centric, for me would be would be great. But that's not there yet. MIDI remote control. What do I think? Well, for a lot of controllers, you know, this kind of thing, this kind of thing, etc., and not only ones made by Akai, uh, I think it's a good idea. It, it's working pretty well. It's pretty easy to set up. Once you get the hang of it, if you've done a couple of them or you've had to do the same one a couple of times, you know how to do it, and you can mostly do the things that you want to do. Obviously, it's not perfect, but then it's pretty flexible, so hopefully it will allow you to do most of the things that you need to do. But as discussed earlier, it doesn't do everything. So for something like this, you'll have some features missing. Whether or not we'll see that updated in the future, I genuinely don't know, but I sincerely hope so. If that is the case, this really will be super, super powerful. At the moment, it's 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 there. Obviously, again, it's one of those features. It's coming with Cubase anyway. I don't know whether it would be the killer feature that would necessarily make somebody upgrade to Cubase 12, but it might mean you can get you know that old controller out of the drawer or whatever and plug it in and start using it for something useful. And that would always be a good thing rather than ending up in landfill. So as ever, I hope you found this video useful. If you have, please like and subscribe, etc. And we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition.